So hello everyone um, and welcome to our Bigger, Better, Stronger Me um, event. So we are Tyne Coast College and this is our um, careers and wellbeing event. So I am delighted to be joined by um, the Mental Health Ambassador for Young People, uh, Dr. Alex George. I'm sure you will all kind of know who he is, um, but it would be fantastic, Alex, if you could give us a little bit of background about kind of who you are and um, how you ended up in that role um, and a little bit more. Thank you so much. Uh, so hello to everyone that's uh, watching today and having to have a time coast uh, college. I hope that... Uh, uh, our chat's going to be helpful. Um, my name's uh, Alex George. I'm an A&E doctor actually by trade. Um, I work in a hospital in South England, so it's kind of quite a busy, what we call a district general hospital. So we see lots of different things from accidents and injuries to illness, infections, mental health course is a big part of uh, our job as A&E doctors. Uh, you might know me from being on the show on Love Island a few years ago. Uh, I came off that show and um, you know, really my focus since then has been around well-being and, uh, and, 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 and mental health uh, and also just trying to give tips and advice to young people about how to look after their health and ha health and happiness. Uh, obviously in the last year I've been working throughout the pandemic. It's been an incredibly busy time for everyone on the front line. Uh, it's been very difficult and challenging I think for young people, uh, whether you're at school, college, apprentice, university, whatever you're doing, I think it's been a huge challenge. Um, I have, you know, been working around mental health for a few years, but uh, the focus really came to a head, I think, with the pandemic. And of course, my, my brother sadly passed away due to suicide in the summer. So um, I have been since then campaigning about mental health and the importance of making sure we're supporting young people. We're destigmatizing mental health. And actually, when people reach out, that there is support there available for them. So I'm going to be doing quite a bit of work in my role as Youth Mental Health Ambassador. Uh, it came about because I started a campaign on social media, which you guys, all of you, helped uh, you know, me kind of build momentum and really bang on that door of number 10. Um, I never really expected, obviously, how far it would have got me. Um, and now I'm working really behind the scenes, uh, offline a lot, really, uh, on many projects uh, about mental health and, and particularly around young people. So we're making progress. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. It does take time, but, you know, we will get there. But I'm glad to be here today. Thank you to everyone that's watching. I'm looking forward to answering a few questions, Jess, and I understand that students are well joining us very shortly. So thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for that. I think that has obviously kind of given us an overview, but uh, like I said, I do have some questions to run through with you as well, um, just so we can dig a little bit deeper into the role that you um, are currently doing, obviously your role as a doctor. Also, um, obviously we know that you are a little bit of an entrepreneur now as well with your work with uh, Prescribed. So we're gonna be having a look into that too. Um, so if we kind of start off then, so firstly, um, we'll start off with the pandemic. Uh, obviously that's the big thing. Um, and I don't want to focus too much on COVID. I know everyone will be sick of hearing about it by now. Um, but how have, um, you and your colleagues found the working throughout the pandemic, working within A&E? Um, how has it been? Obviously it's been a long 12 months. Yeah, it's been pretty tough. I mean, you know, we've had to adapt massively to changing scenario. You know, we, we're used to um, we're used to working in a certain way in a &E and uh, having, you know, minors for small illnesses, majors for being patients that are sicker and our resus or resuscitation uh, department for the sickest patients. And we kind of stream patients and put them in different areas, depending on what they've presented with, and what they come in with. Obviously, during the pandemic, we've had an added problem of having to actually think about, well, We've got patients who have got an infectious uh, condition potentially with COVID. How do we manage patient flow? Where do we put patients? Because you want to keep people separate who might have come in with an ankle injury, for example, or separate from someone who presents with potential COVID. So it was a real headache in that sense to start with. And it took us time actually to adapt. Um, but we did so, I think, pretty well. It was really, it was really, um, the first wave was really hard. You know, really difficult, very, very busy in the hospital I was in. Um, but I'm really proud to be part of the NHS. I think the way the NHS responded and I, I think the people that worked on the front line and those who supported those on the front line has been unbelievable. And I'm really, very glad to say we're kind of heading on the way out now. I'd say things are much better. You know, the, the battle isn't over. I mean, we've all got to be careful, uh, but certainly the vaccine is making a big difference. 
Absolutely. Um, obviously, you mentioned there about being kind of um, feeling proud to work within the NHS. And I feel like everyone feels so proud of our NHS. I know that I do. Um, obviously, I know that's been kind of a really big theme throughout the pandemic is kind of um, support for our NHS workers and, and feeling proud of, of the health service that we have. And obviously, you play your kind of role within that. Um, so the focus of this kind of Q&A and of this session and of the event really is thinking about well-being. So in a role that is so intense, um, how do you manage your own mental health? I think, you know, um, regardless of what career you go into, stress is a part of daily life. Um, you know, when you look at what stress really means, you, you, there's something, a stressor, we call it, something that's, that's making you feel uh, a sense of pressure that you need to perform at a certain level that you've got things you need to do and you know that feeling we feel you're on exam or a work assignment we feel stressed right it's that kind of oh gosh I'm worried about it needs to get done but that happens in life whatever your role is and, and, and being able to manage stress and be able, being able to take care of yourself basically allows you to be not only better at your job or your work or your school or whatever you're doing but it also allows you to do it in a way that's healthy and allows you to be happy at the same time um, of course the pandemic is an extreme uh, version of that but knowing how to look after myself has been really important for me so I I've made sure that I've got outside for a walk every day got natural light and you know, we know that natural light is very important for vitamin d vitamin d is not only good for our bones but our mental health we know that natural light is in itself is beneficial for our mood and how we feel being around green spaces we know is good for anxiety and calming you know making sure i have a walk every day making sure i do some exercise we know exercise is brilliant at releasing stress increasing blood flow to the brain increasing endorphin production getting out you know if you can go for a run or a bit of exercise whatever it might be you let out some of that stress uh, and then you know the other basics as well like sleeping well you know if you've got you know you're having poor sleep and you're tired and you're run down it's going to make everything worse so I, i've really focused on my sleep during this and you know, making sure i go to bed at the right time get up at a regular time i think about putting my phone down before bed blue light and things like that making sure that i'm not having things that stimulating me when i should be going to sleep and then other things about food as well you know we've got to fuel our body to perform uh, and fuel our body to recover and take care of ourselves there's so many aspects of self-care a lot of them should be basic they should be simple things and doing what's intuitive to you i mean you know we talk about you mentioned prescribed i mean the bath bomb company came from a place of self-care like i really enjoyed chucking a bath bomb in relaxing in a bath putting a podcast on or some music and just unwinding and that for me every time i finished a shift especially during the pandemic that has been a godsend to me you know just chilling out relaxing unwinding before i go to bed as being you know mentally it's been second to none and that's why i did all this because i thought well actually i found a bit of real benefit let's let's share this with other people absolutely i think that's so important and um i think that's really key what you said there as well it should be kind of simple things and simple steps that we can all take and sometimes it is about putting your phone down maybe not sitting and scrolling through tiktok for three hours before you can speak, <laughs> which I'm fully as hard as it can be I know, fully guilty of doing that. I fully got sucked into the world of TikTok over lockdown. Um, but yeah, and I think it is about kind of taking those simple steps. What can we do? Um, putting the phone away, maybe eating a little bit better. Um, like you said as well, kind of just getting out, getting outside, getting out for a walk. Um, again, they're little simple things that we can do and incorporate into kind of daily life uh, to make us all feel a little bit uh, happier, which is great. Sure. Um, so we've spoken there a little bit about kind of your role within um, A&E and your role as a doctor um, and we will kind of touch on um, your work as a mental health ambassador as well. But many people watching will know you as uh, Love Island, Dr. Alex from Love Island. Um, I know that's obviously where I first kind of um, saw you on our screens um, and have continued to follow your journey since then. Um, with Love Island, obviously it's, it's very well known, it's a really popular show, but there have been some concerns around mental health and, um, and the programme. So it's put you kind of in the spotlight as well, as it has all of the other contestants. Um, but there have been some concerns, like I said, around kind of mental well-being and things like that with the show. Obviously with the tragic suicide of Caroline Flack and other contestants as well. How do you think that kind of Love Island has, and being on Love Island has impacted the way that you view mental health? 
Well, I think it's you've raised some good, very good points, and um, you know, one of the things that I think we have to think about um, as viewers as well as ITV and you know, uh, broadcasters is about how what we put out on air. How does that impact the people that are watching it, but also impacting the contestants as well? And I think um, it's very important that, for example, with Love Island, that we have to think about things like body image and you know what we're portraying and what what we're showing is it real life and um that's why i think it's so important that itv that these broadcasters of all reality tv shows think about putting out putting people on there that actually reflect society and you know we're not just putting people that appear to have perfect images on there and that because that doesn't that's not real life and that's not how it is and i think one of the good things about the ERs on love island is if you look at the person who won, won the show jack fincham uh, who's a friend of mine, he won't mind me saying this, but he had a very normal physique. He wasn't there with ripped torso or whatever. He was a normal bloke. And I, um, and I think that was a really good thing. And I hope to see that as the years go by, that will evolve and we'll see a much more normal uh, group of people. Um, not to say the people on there that aren't normal, but much more representative group of people, I think, of general society. Um, but I also think, you know, as viewers, we have to remember when we're watching these shows, it isn't real life. And um, to try and remember that you know when, when, when we are you know watching it to watch as entertainment but you know no one looks perfect I mean take for example you know when I was on the show I had six back and I was in shape and all this I had to starve myself to be in that shape and trained way too hard I damaged my social life in terms of not doing all the things I'd usually do in terms of meeting people and stuff and I became very isolated was I healthy absolutely not I'm much healthier now than I was then so yeah. Um, it's all, always worth remembering that, that people have worked so hard to look in a certain way. That's not sustainable. I mean, I don't look like that now. I mean, I don't have a six pack now, but does that mean I'm not healthy? I can cycle pretty far. I can go for long runs. I walk pretty far. I, you know, I could do all the things I want to do. So am I healthy? I'd say pretty healthy. So, um, but it's very important because it does, it does impact. And obviously when I come off the show, it was a huge amount of focus on me and my personal life. And it took some getting used to. And I think when you talk about contestants going on the show, it's very important to think about who can actually cope with that. Um, do they have the ability, the social connections and things that will allow them in terms of, you know, family and close support network to allow them to go on a show and come off. So and I'd always say that to someone, if you're looking to go on a TV show, think very carefully, like, do you want that? Because there's as many positive things, there's negative things. You know, there's, there's this yin and yang. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's something I think we all need to have a bit of perspective, I suppose, and a little bit of context when we're watching these shows that, um, like you said, that's really interesting that you feel kind of um, healthier now than you did back then. And I'm sure Absolutely. you're you're not alone in thinking that I imagine there'll be lots of contestants who have done very similar things um, yeah. before kind of going on a show like that. Mm. Um, so I think that's something we all need to kind of remember um, when we're watching mm. programs like that and, and with social media and things, um, just kind of remembering that what we see isn't always real. Um, we're not always seeing the full picture. Um, and yeah. hundred percent. There's a great, uh, it was a brilliant, um, post I saw on Instagram a few days ago and it was like a graph and it showed like a person's whole life and what you see is this little bit at the top end of like if you look at the whole life like this being like hard part of life that being like things all glossy and nice and you see a tiny little circle at the top you don't see 98 percent of it it's the same as you know things when I'm doing you know people you know talk about what I'm doing my work in the role you know people will only see the finished article of announcement or whatever that what we've done you haven't seen yeah. the 300 odd hours that's gone into making that happen you know so it's always worth for good and bad it's always worth remembering that you don't always see everyone everything that someone's doing so yeah worth, worth remembering and I think we're all guilty of that as well I don't know, well I definitely mm -hmm. am I mean I don't post anything negative um really on social media um I feel like mm -hmm. I try and post the most exciting bits of my life on my Instagram um and I'm not going to post those days where maybe I don't feel so great or whatever um just because I want to keep it maybe as a as a positive space um and I feel like we're all a little bit guilty of kind of showing off the best bits I, I everyone does it and I think it's just being aware of it if we're aware of that and we know that actually there's a lot of stuff we're not seeing that helps it's just having a different angle when you're when you're receiving content just having a little think of it I do try actually and share on my channel the ups and downs and I'm sure people would see that and some might say it's oversharing I don't know but at least I do try because I know you know because of the following I have it's important for me to reflect that and I, I think in the last year you would have seen as many highs and lows and I've been pretty honest about that on my channel
Absolutely. And I think that, like you said, people definitely are aware of that. Um, and I've obviously followed you kind of since Love Island. But I would say now I probably, well, I definitely recognize you more for the work you're doing now than you being to me Thank kind you. of Alex from Love Island. I feel like you don't, you're Dr. Alex in my, in my head now. So I feel like oh, that's thank probably you. Thank kind you. Of as a result of the stuff that I see um, on social media. Um, and like you thank said, you. being transparent, I suppose. Um, so obviously we've spoken there a little bit about Love Island um, and kind of being on the show and putting you in the spotlight. So how did you kind of find the transition from being on Love Island and being in the spotlight, but also returning to work as a doctor? It was difficult at first. I'd be lying if I said it was easy. I think it was such a transition. I mean, you know, we went from 150 followers to over a million followers. It was a really odd, that's a very odd experience for anyone to go through. It really is unusual. And I don't come from a background of being a model in the public eye you know I, I had none of that so you know a, a doctor's training is very focused on his medical career so yeah it was, it was a huge shock and I think going back to work took me a good I think it took me about six months to go back five months to go back um, and actually be comfortable to go back to work and but I actually when I went you know when I went I was really well received the hospital was lovely I settled in pretty quick and you know since then I think I've really enjoyed that balance and I think the hospital keeps me grounded it uh, keeps me very real and I think it uh, keeps me focused on what really matters and it also puts things in perspective you know sometimes I've got stresses and stuff I go into A&E and I see the things I see it helps me go actually that's not such a big deal um, you know and what really matters is our health and our happiness and that's what it comes down to and that's that's I think why it's been so important I think the last year for me it's really I think brought my attention to the fact that you know, what really matters in life is the health and happiness of your friends and family. Everything else is a secondary thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can't even imagine kind of going from, like you said, like over a million followers. Um, and I can't imagine like being in that kind of space, but then also being at work, kind of working a very mm. professional job, also kind mm. of a, a public facing job but in a very different way. So yeah, um, yeah. it's very odd. It's odd. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't can't imagine that at all. Um, so obviously you've just kind of um shared with us there that you do have a very genuine interest for kind of um looking after others. Obviously that is what your kind of profession is. Um, but you have now taken on this role as um, a mental health ambassador um, for young people. So could you tell us a little bit more about kind of the work that you're doing with that and what that involves? Yeah. So yeah, so my, my, my role really is to be uh, an advocate, a voice for young people in decisions around policy, but also what we're doing in terms of stigma and destigmatizing mental health. No, I'm not there as a uh, professor or expert in mental health they've you know there's many advisors there who are you know much more um well you know much more experts or well suited to that kind of thing advising and all that kind of stuff you know my role really is to speak with the charities young people teachers parents uh, and experts to try and work out you know where do you know what needs work you know what do we need to do where are the gaps you know what can we improve should we be putting money here or there or and trying to like you know push the government to do those things really so and as I say a big part of it is the stigma you know a, you know a big part of the role is actually not about just about policy and all that stuff it's actually about trying to make people feel that they can reach out when they're struggling and I know people talk about well when you reach out there's got to be some help there you know when you do so but so many people, particularly young men, and if you look at the situation with my brother, there's so many people who don't reach out. So if they're not, if they feel that stigma, they feel that um, shame or whatever they, you know, they're feeling at the time, and they're not actually asking for help, then all the help in the world and all the support is not going to be beneficial until they will do that. And, you know, in my brother's case, you know, if he'd have reached out, would we have been able to change the outcome potentially? So I think that is a big part of my job, really. And I think sometimes that's potentially not quite a scene I think people are very focused on the funding and all that stuff but a big part of it is actually helping young people to normalize mental well-being and health and illness yeah absolutely um I think like you mentioned there there's kind of this big and it is obviously it's great when there's being kind of more funded funding kind of um dedicated to mental health and things like that but um it's those more kind of tangible actionable things that are actually going to make the difference and like you said mm -hmm. that is kind of um 
kind of addressing the stigma around um, kind of maybe having um, problems yeah. with mental health and things like that and how to actually yeah, and, um, through it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Everything takes time. You know, you can't just change these. You know, we're talking about decades of, uh, I would say, underfunding for mental health and decades of stigma, you know, if not more than that. And I, it takes time to unravel this. And, you know, I'm just one tiny piece of that jigsaw puzzle and I, I i see myself as starting this role but i see someone else coming in and taking over at some point you know it's for me to start things off and someone else to carry the bat and that's how i see things yeah definitely and obviously um kind of this is where your um big following you you have a huge platform really we were talking about kind of um over a million followers or whatever on instagram really you are kind of a fantastic person to be championing mental health um, and obviously you. you do have your own kind of personal um, experiences um, with it as well and I think um, that again makes you that kind of perfect person to be um, really pushing this because people will relate to you and you you may be more relatable than, than somebody who is currently already working in government um, so I think that I think that's mm. really fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so we've obviously spoken a little bit about, about kind of mental health then. Um, I think a big thing that causes stress for young people is thinking about what they're going to do in the future. And I know for me personally, this did cause me considerable stress when I was going through kind of those key decision years, particularly GCSE, um, thinking about what you're going to go on and do after that. Um, what would you kind of what would your best advice be for those students who maybe don't know what they want to do yet or maybe have an idea but they're unsure of kind of how to get there i think a lot of people can relate to this and actually you know I, okay uh, it might mean that you know i was kind of fortunate that I, I kind of had a clear idea of what i wanted to do but actually um even when you choose to do medicine you know you could be a skin doctor you could be a psychiatrist you could be a trauma doctor you could be there's honestly as many career options within medicine as outside medicine it feels anyway i know obviously there's more but there's a lot of things so you're actually deciding what way you want to go it can be difficult and actually i talk about this in my book and, and live well um every day i talk about the idea that purpose and passion is so important in your life so working out you know what your passions are so for me it was um I enjoyed science i like learning about anatomy the human body i enjoy people i like adrenaline a bit as well you know I love the cars and things I like the idea of adrenaline and fast-paced life and when I sat down and thought about it I was like well if I combine all the things that I like doing what jobs actually would give me those and then I worked out well you know Formula One driver would be one but that's never going to happen I'm never going to be a Formula One driver unfortunately um, so what are my options in life and so I looked through all the things that kind of fit with that and I worked out well actually doing medicine or going to medical school being a doctor actually would tick a lot of those boxes so I was like well actually that will give me those passions if you bring them together um and have a think about it it actually gives me my purpose and you know when now you know my career I still look at what I do and think well actually yeah it does tick most of the boxes of what I enjoy in life I like people I love meeting people I love the idea of you know science I love learning I love um love all those things and it's great and I think anyone that's watching this you know have a think about what makes you tick you know and when they you know, the saying, I don't can't remember quite how it goes, but, you know, you, you, you know, if you fight, look at what your passions are, then, you know, money and your career and occupation will follow. You do have to think a little bit. You can't, obviously, you know, there's some career uh, routes maybe aren't, you know, give you as many op occupations at the end as others. And, you know, it's always a balance, I guess. And you're like, if I'd have chased being a Formula One driver, then I, I don't, I, I would, well, I wouldn't be good enough. But, you know, you've got to have a think about what's realistic. And I think that's important. But also, follow your dreams you know if you if you are really passionate about something you know and you really like that area then then, then follow that and just look at how you can turn it into a career or what career it suits most and, and I'm a big fan of lists um I talk about this in the book as well the idea of you know writing a list of all your passions and then you know drawing diagrams draw, draw you know big circles you know, what what jobs what careers actually link all these things together once you've got a list of a few careers so you've shortlisted two or three or two or three degrees or colleges or whatever uh, courses i mean then you know write pros and cons what are the pros and cons of that decision and then slowly you'll work down to a situation where you've got your yes or no you're like this is what i'm going to do and nothing's perfect in life i mean the other thing i would say is that your passions might change you might be in your 30s and think actually you know i might decide well, actually do you know what? I, I this fast-paced lifestyle 
in A&E doesn't suit me anymore. I actually want to go and, you know, I just want to write my books or I might want to do that. And that's absolutely fine. You know, most people now in the modern day don't follow one career for the rest of their life. It's actually unusual that people would remain in the same career. And there's nothing wrong with that. Life is about evolving, about learning, about following a journey. You know, it's not about the end goal. Life is, you know, it's a cliche thing, but I believe it's very true. Life is all about that journey. It's not, it's not about reaching that end goal. Definitely. I think that's so important. And um, obviously within my role, I speak to students a lot about kind of their options and things like that. And I'm such a big advocate for doing things you enjoy um, because I, I think Absolutely. generally if you enjoy something, you'll do better in it is usually how it yeah. goes. Um, yeah, yeah. And genuine interest then you're more likely to kind of excel in those subjects um, and things like that so I'm definitely a big fan of doing things that you kind of actually enjoy and also like you said we're it's unlikely that you're going to be doing the same job kind of um, yeah. for the rest of your life and that is perfectly fine and the decisions yeah. you make now ultimately are not decisions that are going to completely kind of um, close off any options for you. There's always things you can do to kind of um, get into the career that you're interested in. For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, so I, I completely agree. And and like you mentioned there, obviously you've got your book. I know you've got your podcast um, and you've got Prescribed as well, which we spoke about before. Um, how has it been kind of managing those different things? And I suppose you'll have had to have developed new skills, kind of being an entrepreneur and things like that. How, how has that been? <laughs> I think, it, you know, I love life because every day you learn something new. You really do. And that's why I enjoy life. And uh, I, and I had to learn so much in the last few years. Like you say, you know, starting in the bath bomb, I sat in the bath one day and thought, I love this. You know, I really enjoy bath bombs. Why don't I make a company out of it? I'd love to make a, a company. It's got, you know, it's vegan. It's from things about the environment a bit more cruelty free. It's like a really nice self-care brand that's wholesome and something exciting and I got really excited about that idea and thought well why not let's do it and um you know I've reached out to to a company that helped develop these kind of things and I, you know I've really enjoyed learning the process and I've had to learn to juggle I've had to learn to manage my time and work with different teams but you find a way you know and you find a way to do it I'm very fortunate I've got a brilliant team that I work with you know management team that help you know uh, you know my work stuff is in non you know a and e's there but you know managing stuff i do with brands or making this product etc um but uh, as i say it's, it's it's exciting you you learn new things and some days are quite stressful as you'd imagine but yeah i, I absolutely love it i absolutely love it fantastic um like you said it's kind of um learning new skills and things like that you're always going to be developing always learn there's always yeah. something new to learn um i think it's really exciting though that you've been able to kind of turn your kind of passions and things into a business um i feel like we've yeah. seen a lot of that over um lockdown i've seen a lot of my friends kind of turning their kind of hobbies into um ways to make money which has been great um, and i feel like a lot of people have been doing that kind of um throughout the pandemic yeah it's a business is exciting and you know you shouldn't be afraid to do something new you know it, i i think sometimes um and i say this carefully it's, it's about taking measured risks you know life is a constant risk everything you do in life has a risk it's taking measured risk but it's not about it's don't let fears and worries of what if prevent you from doing something you know if you if you've got an idea in mind maybe business or otherwise might be a career whatever it is that's why i say write the pros write the cons write the reasons why the reasons why not write the things that are risks and write the things that are more or less likely guaranteed and 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 you'll find that you'll come to a balanced decision but don't let you know what if it doesn't work stop you doing things you know the platform stuff could fail um but it's 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 something i wanted to try and give it a go and as long as it doesn't put you into massive risk and you know and all that and you you build things slowly you work hard you will often find that you'll make things work but you know lots of people you know i, I failed many times in my life you know i i when I applied to medical school the first time round, I got a place at Liverpool Med School. I was supposed to go with my best mate there. We were so looking forward. I missed out by two marks in my chemistry A level. My actual coursework was dropped. Um, you know, even the exam did well. I got my A's apart from um, one actual uh, uh, section, and I yeah dropped down to a B. Uh, and the med school wouldn't take me, so I had to reapply, redo the coursework go through all the interviews again, go through the stress of not knowing if I'd have a place. Uh, and then I got my place, you know, so I had to fail, learn from that failure, pick myself up and carry on. In life, you will have knockbacks. I'd say that to anyone. 
you know, you will never have a life that's free of knockbacks and things that go wrong. But learning to deal with those, picking yourself up and going again is what matters. You know, you learn far more from your failures than you do your successes. I always think that. I've learned, along, my, along the way, I've learned from my failures. I've had a lot of them and you learn. Absolutely. Um, and I always kind of joke about this as well, but I always think your failures and things like that, they make perfect answers for an interview question. If you ever have a job interview, <laughs> your, your failures, they make fantastic. Gold dust. The gold dust. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so there's always a positive, <laughs> even when something maybe doesn't go to plan. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that is brilliant um and kind of thank you for answering my questions that kind of wraps up the i suppose the q a element um of Perfect. this um but we do have some very kind of lucky students obviously this is kind of who this event is for is for our students um for sure. and we we did kind of put out um, a bit of a competition to kind of see if we can get some good questions for you and i know that our students are dying to kind of come on and have a chat with you. As I mentioned then, um, we now are joined by our um, fantastic set of students. So these students were lucky enough to win the competition um, we put out on social. So they've asked some fantastic questions. They're now gonna have the opportunity to actually ask Alex. Um, so if we start with um, Jake then. Um, so Jake, I know you have a really interesting question. If you could just kind of introduce yourself and then ask away. Uh, hi, I'm Jake, I'm a final phase deck officer trainee. Um, my question to Alex is, as a young person who works at sea, which is obviously quite an isolated career, what uh, any tips would be to benefit young people's mental health in that sort of situation? Oh, hi, uh, Jake. Thanks so much for the question. I think it's a really, really good point to raise. I mean, um, I think regardless of uh, whether you're going, you know, whether to a naval career, whether you're going abroad, whether you're going to university or a new area, um, I think going into a situation where you might feel or potentially feel isolated can really impact on your mental health. I think almost regardless of your of your age, but particularly when you're young. I mean, I I went to um, medical school in uh, Plymouth for the first year or so, and I'm from Wales. Uh, so it was miles away from family, from friends. I didn't know anyone there at all. Uh, and I actually had to really make sure I was looking after my mental health when I went there so that I didn't, you know, begin to feel too lonely or affected by it all. And, um, you know, some of the tips I would say is, particularly when it comes to loneliness, is just make sure that you're keeping in touch with everyone at home. I actually remember at the time I was calling my friends back at home, messaging them every day to keep in touch, speaking with my family. Um, you know, arranging things. Now we've got all these Zoom calls and things, making sure you're getting calls in with family at home. Um, I think it's quite helpful as well to, you know, if you go into somewhere, take some photos of like family with you or friends. Like I've even now got pictures of mates and family and stuff in the flat. And I, it just helps me to, to feel that bit with you and stuff. Um, I also think, uh, you know, focusing on yourself while you're, while you're away as well. So making sure you get your exercise, you're sleeping well, you keep your diet well, you've got hobbies and things you're interested in. So, whether it's a sport or whatever it is you like, but making sure that you're keeping active because sometimes you spend too much time with your own thoughts that can make things worse. And also don't feel embarrassed by it. You know, I think most people going away in that situation would feel the same. So speaking to other young people, other people around you and saying, look, you know, I feel a certain way. How are you doing? And, and you'll find a lot of the time people say, well, actually, yeah, I feel, I feel the same. So there's a real help in that as well. So getting through it together. Yeah. Thank right. you for your question, my friend. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. That was Good great. luck. I think that was a really good question. Um, I remember when we saw that one come through and we all kind of looked at that. It's a brilliant that. question. Really, really good question. Great Thanks question. So much, a, lot of, a lot of us feel that, especially during the pandemic at the moment, a lot of us feel that way. And, you know, I've been isolated here a lot in London and uh, it's weird. You can be in a city with so many people, but still be quite isolated. Um, so, yeah, it's a really, really important thing. I think, you know, there's a recent study, a survey by the uh, Office of National Statistics and found that young people were, were pretty lonely, actually, a lot of the time. So, you know, let's all take an effort, take time to, to make sure we're interacting with people, reaching out, people who haven't heard from a friend for a while, reach out and see how, see how they're doing. Definitely. Yeah, yeah thank you. That was thank brilliant, you. Jake. Thank you. Um, so we are now going to move on to um, Isabel. Fantastic. Fantastic. Ask away. Ask away. Hi, I'm Isabel. I'm a deputy director here in Sochi. Um, my question is, out of the entire experience of coronavirus, what would be your one piece of advice for younger people to take away into their future? 
thank you Isabel so much and I think the last year for, for everyone has been such a such a shock I think to the system uh, particularly when it comes to, to to mental health and I think one of the things that I really hope we've all learned is that how important looking after our mental health actually is and how important it is that we break down stigmas so that people can reach out and speak to each other and help each other uh, and I think actually you know for my role and the work that I'm doing what I really want to do is work with young people uh, and try and you know, make progress, I guess, in the sense of uh, allowing, you know, you know, us to all feel more comfortable about talking about mental health, mental health well-being and allowing people to reach out when, when they feel that they need support. I think it would be brilliant, I think, if all of us, young people, but everyone, I think, taking forward from this pandemic, that we all, you know, really make, make sure we don't forget, you know, how important self-care is, how important mental well-being is, you know, some of the things I've talked about, about exercise and things in the previous questions, how important those are, but also that we all carry on the fight for mental health as well and breaking down the stigma, making sure that we're all, you know, prioritizing our well-being as, as we move forward into, into the years that come. So yeah, it's a, it's gonna be um it's gonna be it's gonna take time. Like I said earlier on, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You can't change things and change and uh, destigmatize mental health overnight. But you know, together we'll do it, I think. And uh, I think there's a lot of passion now from young people particularly to to make a change and make a long lasting change. So yeah, thank you for your question. Thanks, Isabel. Um, that was fantastic, Isabel. Thank you. Um, so we're just going to move on now to Ash. Uh, hi, um, my name is Ash, and I was uh, wondering what made you like get into being a doctor. What inspired you to do it? Oh gosh, um, thanks for your question. Uh, I actually, um, like I was saying a little bit earlier, I think I. I really enjoyed um, uh, science at, uh, at school. I loved learning. I loved the uh, anatomy and all that kind of stuff, physiology and, um, you know, the idea of science just, it just really like, you know, it was something I was really interested in. But I also was someone that like, liked adrenaline. I like fast paced. I just like excite, you know, a bit of, not drama, but, you know, a bit of thrill in life. And I really thought, well, actually, it's a good way of combining that together with enjoying working as a team, working with people in a way that, you know, my career actually reflected my passions or things that I enjoyed. And, you know, uh, medicine, med school, uh, being a doctor, you know, it's it, it, there's different careers for everyone, but particularly working A and E, you can have that fast pace, you're working in a team, there's a lot of science involved, uh, it's definitely a lot of adrenaline. So yeah, it really reflected my interests, I guess. Wow, thank you thank for you. answering that. Cool. Thank you, Ash. Thank you. That was brilliant. Um, so we will move on to um, Caroline now. Um, so if you could just unmute yourself. Hi. Am I on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hiya. Um, hi, Alex. Um, I'm on the men oh well, I'm on the access course for health, and I've just been accepted in Northumbria University to do mental health. So this is quite exciting for us. <laughs> but my question oh, is, um, what are some things we can do every day to improve our mental well-being? Well, first of all, congratulations, and I take my half to anyone that goes into work in, in mental health. And I think it's a very exciting career, and it's a space. I, you know, I think it, I'm excited. You know, about the prospect of mental well-being and health being, you know, so important to everyone in this country, and the fact that you know you're able to go into into a space that you can really help people. I think is incredible. And I know you'll have a really amazing career. Thank um, you. So some of the things I think for 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 self care, I think looking after your well-being, it should be it should be intuitive it should feel natural it should feel right and it's different for everyone but I think the fundamentals are quite similar so you know when we talk about sleep it's making sure that you know we get up at a similar time in the morning go to bed to a similar, similar time that we're actually allowing um you know our a space in which we can actually have good quality sleep you know that sounds like basics but what's the room temperature like are we unwinding before bed or are we on tiktok until late uh, at night you know is the room dark enough uh, for us to, to sleep are we having too much caffeine later in the day that's stopping us sleep you know other elements me. of stuff there you go it's caffeine <laughs> caffeine especially at university you end up drinking loads of caffeine and then it's a kind of a counterproductive cycle so just thinking about things like sleep thinking about am i exercising a little bit you know not over exercising there's obviously a balance so you want to get the nhs has guidance on how much exercise you should get but you know i'd say i get out for a good walk every day a couple of times a week i do a bit of a workout um, I make sure I do things for self-care as well, like in terms of unwinding. So if I've got a stressful day in A&E or something, I have a check a bath bomb in, have a bath, have to put a podcast on, 
um, you know, and I make sure I communicate with people as well. And I talk about, I talk to people about what I'm going through. We spoke about loneliness a little bit earlier. And um, I think one of the things I worry about with uh, modern life and like Instagram and everything is we're becoming more detached from people. Uh, you know, we need to make sure, particularly coming out of the pandemic, we're having those face-to-face -face relationships and contacts with your friends. We're picking up the phone like the old days and having a chat on the phone. Uh, and all those aspects come together for helping you feel good. And I would say to anyone, if you're thinking, oh, I'm not feeling great, first of all, talk to someone about how you're feeling because a lot of people are feeling that way at the moment. But also have a look about what you're doing in your life. Are you looking after yourself? Are you doing the things that actually will make you feel better? Or are you just working really hard all the time, not having the downtime and not, yeah, just not giving yourself that space to, to, to feel better, you know, and to, to actually look after yourself. So, yeah, those are some of the things I would say. Um, you know, but self-care is an investment in yourself. That's the way I see it. And if you want to be good at your job, if you want to be successful, you know, at your work, if you want to be, you know, good in your relationships and your friendships, that's all got to come from a place of looking after yourself. And in the work you're going to be doing in mental health, you know, to be able to look after, you know, patients and people, you've got to look after you as well. So, so make sure you do take time for yourself. And that's for everyone and regardless of what career you're going into. But yeah, thank you for your question. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was a really good one as well. I'm thinking about what we can do, the little steps we can take each day. And that was brilliant. Um, and then finally, um, Ian, if you would like to ask your question. Hi, I'm Ian. I'm also known as photography Ian Williams on Instagram, which you have seen, Alex. Um, my question is, how have doctors cope with the COVID pandemic with different rules and regulations? Well, thank you, and I think that's a. I think what's been pretty hard, I think, throughout the whole pandemic, is things keep changing and evolving. I think it's for everyone, you know, the rules change, and um, you know, depending on how many cases there are, how many people are admitted to the hospital, you know, the situation changes, and the rules have to reflect that. So, uh, and, and also, of course, you know, we've had lockdowns, we've had restrictions, and now we're obviously having easing restrictions. And I think, from a like a, a medical perspective, a doctor's perspective, we're keen to make sure that. Um, we know we lift the restrictions gently and in a safe way so that we actually uh, don't see the cases rising really, really quickly. But it seems that things are going well. Um, you know, the numbers aren't shooting up in this country. Obviously, if you look at other countries in Europe, they're having a different experience, but things are going well at the moment. And like I said, I touched upon this point as well. I think generally for everyone, I would say, you know, just because you're seeing restrictions lifting, they're not milestones you have to hit. Like just because you know, um, you know, we can now go to the shops. Doesn't mean you have to rush to the busy environments like Primark or, or whatever. You know, you you do what you feel comfortable with. You know, I personally am not going to rush to busy environments. I don't want to be in those spaces because that would make me feel a bit anxious. So, do things as you're ready and don't feel pressurized to do that uh, to to kind of rush or whatever. But thank you, Ian, and uh, thank you for your, for your good question. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so a massive thank you um, to all of our students there. I think those were some great questions um, with some great answers as well. And I hope you've all kind of taken something away from that. Um, but that was fantastic having you all on. Um, so what I'm going to do now is um, ask you all to head off the meeting um, and I will just wrap things up with Alex. But thank you all so much. Um, thank you, everyone. Take care of yourselves. Yeah, Thank, thank you. you very much. And brilliant. thank you for your brilliant questions. Thanks good time good luck everyone so a huge thank you um it's been so great having you on um and i know as you've just mentioned um you are such a busy person and um i really really do appreciate you kind of giving up some time to speak with us today and our students i know no, that thank you They'll have really appreciated that. Um, I think it's been fantastic. I think we've had a really good chat um, and, and you've answered some kind of big questions that not only I have, <laughs> but the students have as well. So it's been great. Well, thank you very much. And good luck to everyone. Thank you for everyone's time you know, watching this. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the event as well. Brilliant. Um, so for everyone um, that is watching, you now can enjoy the rest of the event. So we've got the main halls with um, the, the different kind of curriculum areas. Um, and we do have some other sessions later on in the day as well. Um, but yeah, thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. That was just, that was brilliant.